cannot solve it There is no mountain too tall He cannot move it There is no storm too dark God cannot calm it There is no sorrow too deep he cannot soothe it And if he carried the weight of the world Upon his shoulders ooh, I know my brother that he will carry you And if he carried the weight of the world song. It is a comfort to know that we have a, a God who will walk with us even through the valley of the shadow of death. Right? Even, even through the valley. There's no place He will send us that He will not walk with us. Give us the strength, carry us if need be, to get us through the road that He's called us to. And uh, that's, a, that's a blessing. And I appreciate the song and the good reminder for all of us tonight. I want to share a few thoughts this evening uh, in 2 Timothy. Remember last Sunday night I told you I shortened up the message a bit. I just felt like I needed to uh, cut it off at a certain point. And uh, I want to share some of the thoughts that I didn't get to last Sunday night. And give us a little insight into the charge that the Apostle Paul gave to Timothy. That young preacher... Start reading in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we're going to start reading in verse 14, and read down through chapter 4, 
verse 2. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 14, Paul instructs Timothy, this young pastor, he says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And that from a child thou hast known the holy scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. All scripture is given by inspiration of God, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be instant, in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. Last Sunday night, we spoke about an all sufficient word that God has given us. He's given us His word, and it is sufficient to accomplish His purposes, the purposes of an all sufficient Savior who not only wants to save our souls, but to make us like Him. And He has given His Word to accomplish that task. And last Sunday night we talked about, from those verses in chapter 3 we read, that Scripture is a lifetime priority, that the Word of God has saving power, that Jesus is the key to unlocking the Word of God, that the Scripture not only can save, but it can purify and sanctify us, and that it is sufficient for the task. He's given us a sufficient word. And so it makes sense as we go into chapter 4, and Paul has laid that foundation about how good the word is, that he turns then to Timothy and he says, I charge thee therefore. And we'll go into some more of that, but I charge you therefore to preach the word. Proclaim this word. Speak. Share the word of God. We see that word therefore at the beginning of verse 1 in chapter 4. And when you see the word therefore, you all know this one, right? When you see the therefore, you need to ask what the therefore is there for. All right? And the reason the therefore is there, it's building upon those points that the Word of God is complete. So if we have this treasure here, if we have this treasure, therefore, what do we need to do with it? In fact, he doesn't just say, I charge you, therefore, based upon the all-sufficient Word, but he reminds us of some other things. He says, I'm going to charge you, Timothy, not just because we have a sufficient Word, but I'm charging you before God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that makes it even more serious, right? I'm giving you a charge, a commission, a calling, a command, before God, with God as my witness, and the Lord Jesus Christ. And what does he say about Jesus? This Jesus who is going to judge the quick or the living and the dead, all. He's going to judge everyone. And he's going to appear, and he mentioned, and his kingdom. There's three things there he mentions about Christ. Now, we know as I was... Uh, Working on the office back there, uh, getting kind of things situated and getting, uh, getting things ready. And uh, for me, there was a, a, a picture Brother Stapleton had on the wall, and it was featured, and it had many of the names of Jesus Christ. And uh, it's uh, <clears throat> pretty neat, honestly. And as we think about Jesus Christ, I mean, there are many names of Christ he could have employed here, he could have used, he could have talked about, you know, in the name of the Lion of the tribe of Judah, or the Messiah, or the Day Star, or something like that. He could have used one of those names, but what he reminds us of about Jesus is that he is the judge. The judge. And if he is a judge, a judge must rule in accordance with a standard with some statute, some regulation, some law that guides them as to what they will do with this issue before them. What do you suppose that standard will be by which Christ judges everybody? 
His Word. Will it not be His Word? That He has given to us right here the standard by which all of us will be judged. Jesus said in Matthew 12, 36, I tell you on the day of judgment, people will have to give an account for every careless word they speak. There's a day appointed whereby we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. And we will have to give an account for ourselves. And that standard is God's word. He's shown us how we will be judged here. That makes it serious. Very serious. Number two, he's going to come back. There is a point at which it will be pencils down, hand in your paper. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? You've been, been there, done that, and you're furiously trying to finish up, and the teacher says, pencils down, give it in. No matter what you've done, it's done right now. This is the time of the reckoning to see how you have accomplished the task you've been given, how you have fared on that test. And we are reminded that he has promised just as he left, he's going to come back. There's a day of reckoning, a day when this is going to happen. And he also mentions here his kingdom. And this kingdom that, that Christ is, is the king of is a kingdom that is going to consume all other kingdoms. It is the only thing that will remain. And only what is done unto Christ that is enduring in his kingdom is something that's going to last. And so he, he brings all of these things and says, look, you're going to be judged by the word. It's going to happen. Christ is coming back. And he's given us this instruction here so that we can live this life so that what we live, what we do can actually matter and last. And because of those three reasons, and we have before us in the word of God everything we need pertaining to life and godliness through Christ, we need to put this word out there. People need to hear this. People need to see this. And so it's in the solemnity of all of those things. Paul says, Timothy, I charge you, preach the word. Proclaim this. People need to hear it. And he tells them, when? When do you proclaim the word? He says in verse 2, be instant in season and out of season. Now, I've heard that passage used many times growing up. And one of the not uncommon things I grew up around was uh, where a preacher would show up and visit a church and unprepared to preach and the pastor would go back and say hey I'm glad you're here you're preaching tonight <laughs> be instant in season and out of season that's what that's what they say they'd use that verse to say you always need to be ready to preach whether you've prepared or not to preach while it's always good to be prepared to, to bring a word a message from the word of the Lord that's not the fullness of what that passage means it's talking about the soil. There's times, like right now, I heard some of you say you were out scratching in the garden today, right? Getting ready to plant. This is the season, right? To go out there and get things ready. If you've not already done it, this is the season to go out there and be planting things and growing things. This is the time of year where the soil is meant to receive the seed. The soil is meant to receive the plants. The, the environmental conditions are such that it's conducive for these plants to be able to grow and be nurtured because of the temperatures and the sunlight and all the things. And so for growing things, we're in season. But there are times that the soil is not quite so welcoming to those plants. And the weather is colder and it's darker and it's out of season. And what we're being told here is we're kind of likening this to people. There are times when people, like the Philippian jailer, will come up and say, what do I have to do to be saved? And, and, the, and the soil is ready to receive the word. And they're asking you, and it's just like, you know, laid before you on a platter. And you are excited and ready to jump in and share the word. But what Paul is telling Timothy is that there are going to be times that the soil is not going to look like it's ready for the seed. 
In fact, people will not want to hear and they'll push away and they'll want to act like it's irrelevant or you're offensive to them and yet you feel that you need to share the word. Paul says don't regard the condition of the soil when it comes to sowing the word. You need to be able to, willing to tell them what they need to hear whether they want to hear it or not. Now, this isn't saying that we should throw wisdom out, you know, and that there's a good time, a proper time to say things and to not. I'm not, I'm not telling us to go and just start beating on everybody's door and getting in their face. But, but we can't just look at how willing and welcoming they are to the word as the sole judge of whether we should say something. Because whether they like it or not, this is the word which we all will be judged by. And Jesus is coming back. And only what is planted in Christ is going to last. I mean, how many of us were willing and welcoming when the word of the Lord first came to us? I know I rebelled hard against that. I did not want to hear that. People come talk to me about the Lord and those things, and I just shut down. I didn't want to talk to them. I didn't want to encourage them to talk to me. I was like Brother Jimmy back there, you know, gripping the, you know, the pews. I did not want to hear those things because they were condemning and convicting, and I didn't want anyone to think that I wanted to hear those things. But I still needed that seed, didn't I? I still needed that word to be proclaimed. And so that's speaking really about the soil. And it tells us here, you know, and it's not only lost people that can be hard soil. Sometimes we can get hardened and the Apostle Paul tells Timothy to reprove, rebuke, and exhort. To reprove, we talked about last Sunday night, is to convict or convince someone, to be able to show them. Now, you say, well, the, the Holy Spirit's the one who convicts, and truly, that's who does the work in the heart. We can't touch the heart. But we are to lay out those truths of God that he might use to convince them and convict them in their heart. It is the sword of the Spirit, but we are the ones who are to lay it out. And then he'll take it and he'll use it. But we are to bear the sword and lay it out. So we are to reprove and even to rebuke. A rebuke is a sharp warning. It's pointed. It's specific. Sometimes we have to be sharp and pointed with the Word of God and the truths. We have to, to get into the details at times and be real honest with people because they need that. They don't always want to hear it, but, but there are times to get there. And then, not just the negative, but the positive. To exhort, which means to come along and encourage with the Word, with those great and precious promises of God that can strengthen the soul and remind us what God said He will do. You know, it's one thing to go along somebody and say, you know, I think it'll be all better. But it's a whole other thing to be able to show them that says, look, the Lord says if you lean upon Him, He will be here for you. He says it. He says it. And if you are a person who is convinced about the reliability, the infallibility of this word, the sufficiency of this word, my friends, that is the most precious thing you could give them is to say them to them, thus says the Lord. God has said, if you lean upon him, he will carry you. He will be with you. He will never leave you or forsake you. You know, it's, it's quite a different thing to be able to come along and encourage with those truths and to know you have the solid foundation of a promise to rest upon. Because I don't know about you, but I thought many times you're wrestling with myself and it's like, well, I know the Lord says that, but, but you know, would he do that for me? You know, I know it says that and you know, those other people deserve it more, but I don't. You know, one time I just felt like the Lord struck me and says, who are you to think that I would violate my word for you? Who, who are you to think I'm going to go back on something that I've said because of you? If I've said it, I've said it. And it doesn't matter who you are or what you are. If I have said it, that is my word. And it has gone forth and it's not going to change no matter who you are. That was kind of humbling, but encouraging to me. Right? 
Now, we need to have discernment to know when and where to deliver this, but we see from those words, the reprove and the rebuke and the exhort, that these are some down-in-the-weeds words. It's one thing for me to get up here and talk about Jesus is all-sufficient, and the Word of God is sufficient, you know, and share these types of kind of general messages where we can all get and say, yeah, we're on the same page, but there's times where we have to get down in the weeds and we got to get specific, and these are words about kind of getting into the specifics. And that's where we're going to have to go. But that's where God's Word meets us. It meets us right there in those places. This is where the rubber meets the road. And God has something to say to us about all aspects of our life. And how do we do this? You hear those words reprove and rebuke. And perhaps you think of sharpness, hardness, getting in somebody's face and shaking your finger. Paul says you do this with long suffering and doctrine. The way you do this, the way you do this reprove and rebuke and exhort is with patience and with teaching. Not, not from anger and bitterness, but from love. Because love is patient. Right? Love is patient. I love that verse that speaks about the law coming from Moses, but grace and truth came from Jesus Christ. Not just truth, but grace and truth came from Jesus Christ. Because he not only spoke the way no one else had ever spoke and said things that people never thought that way before, and so he brought truth, but he demonstrated it all in love. You see, that patience that we need to have with people, it can be hard at times. But one of these verses that I... I took to heart as a, as a young pastor is just a few verses before this in 2 Timothy 2. It says the servant, it's at the end of, of chapter 2, it says the servant of the Lord must not strive. We're not fighting with people. But be gentle unto all men. Apt to teach. Patient. In meekness, realizing that you're not above it too, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. That's what people are doing when they're rebelling against God. They're hurting themselves. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves, if God, peradventure, perhaps, will grant them knowledge of, the, excuse me, will grant them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth, and that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. The one you're fighting is not the person, it's the devil. And the devil's the one who's ensnared them and trapped them in some, some thought pattern, some addiction, something going on in their life where they feel and think that this is the right way. Satan's tricked him. He's a liar. He's the father of lies. That's how he works. How do you fight a lie? With the truth. Amen. Patience. Patience, showing that love. Teaching, that's how you do it. Why does he end that back again with teaching? You, you, you reprove, rebuke, and exhort with, with this patience and with teaching. Why? Because we have a sufficient word. This word is our authority. This word is alive and it's mighty in the hands of the Spirit of God. And ultimately... We are seeking to build durable convictions in the hearts of people. That's something that God has just really seized my soul about um, as I've been thinking about this pastorate and just ministry in general the last couple years. It's not enough for everybody to be saying the same thing to just say it. What we all need are deep convictions in our heart about what's right. We need to know that we know that these things are right and true and that we're doing this to be obedient to the Lord. And I'll tell you what Jesus told or spoke of um, in the, uh, when he talked about the, the rich man and Lazarus. Of course, wanted Lazarus to be sent back to go and tell his family about hell so that they would avoid that place where he was at. And Jesus said, look, if they won't hear Moses and the prophets. 
It doesn't matter how many signs and wonders you do in front of them, it's not going to make a difference. Moses and the prophets was a reference to the Word of God. And that was the point. If the Word of God won't change their hearts, then nothing will change their hearts Amen. because they've hardened their hearts against the Lord. And so we have before us this awesome opportunity, this awesome responsibility to dig into these things together, to do this work together, to learn and to grow in the Word, to let it touch and saturate our lives and to let it pour forth from us so that Jesus can do the work that He is seeking to do in this world. Let's not be ashamed of His Word. Those are the thoughts I want to share uh, tonight. Again, I'm glad that you all are with us. And I mentioned earlier that we do have a business meeting scheduled this evening. And I do believe it's the custom of the church to have a verse of a song. Um, and at that time, open the doors of the church. I want to tell the visitors, you are absolutely welcome to stay and to observe the business meeting. Only the members can participate and vote in the meeting, but you are more than welcome to stay and observe. If you, if you want to leave, uh, you're welcome to do that too, and this would be an opportune time to do so. But as we sing um, a verse of a song tonight, and we stand and sing, if someone um, has it on their heart, they're not a member of this church, and the Lord has, is burdening you to join this work, um, we look for really two things. Number one, you, you need to be saved. We need to know that you're saved. We need to know that you know what it means to be a Christian and that you had an encounter with God that you know about and can relate to us because that's what we first and foremost share in common. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And so we ask anyone who would come forward to share about that moment when they pass from death into life. And the second thing, when you come forward, I don't believe a church is just for the saved, it's a club. but it's an organization for the saved who want to serve God. And that's what we do when we come to join the church. We profess that we know Jesus Christ and we want to put our hand on the plow. And we want to serve Jesus Christ in this place. And those are the things I believe we look for when we join. So as we stand tonight, if the Lord's put it on your heart to join this church, we ask you to come forward at this time so we can hear your testimony. Blue book, number 99. <clears throat>